Welcome back. In this lecture, I want to talk about the thought of Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, on evil. Well, there have been several significant philosophers in the past few centuries, majorly significant philosophers. Leibniz and Hegel also come to mind. It's hard to imagine that anyone would seriously contest Kant's claim to be the most revolutionary and most foundational thinker of the modern world. His thought is as fundamental and far-reaching as Plato's or Aristotle's or Aquinas's or Augustine's or Descartes. It's simply impossible to imagine putting another modern philosopher into that group of people. Now, Kant had, for all his revolutionary intellectual power, a quite uh, pedestrian life. He was born in 1724 in the town of Königsberg in East Prussia. Uh, it was his hometown throughout his childhood. And in fact, he never in his entire life traveled more than 110 miles from Königsberg. He had offers to move to other universities eventually. He never took them. He was raised in a very strict pietist family, and that background stuck with him his whole life, long after he stopped being a pietist himself as a young adult. Pietism was a form of German Protestantism, which was very rigorous and very, very focused on having the proper emotional response to the scriptures and to one's experience of religious salvation. And also it was a very, uh, a very moralistic kind of religion. He enrolled at the University of Königsberg in his hometown in 1740. And he would remain there at the university as a student and then a professor for basically the rest of his life. Initially, actually, Kant was uh, a scientist who made uh, significant discoveries, really made his name in a way, um, in kind of planetary physics. He discovered some interesting discrepancies in the velocity of the Earth's rotation due to tidal variations, believe it or not. Um, and these discrepancies, what he discovered, um, has actually been of really substantial importance for planetary science. It was not fully appreciated. People recognized its interest and in insight in the 18th century, but it was not fully appreciated for what it meant for understanding how worlds move and things like that until the 19th century. But in 1755, at the age of 31, he became a lecturer at the university. That was his first real job. And he was assigned to teach on metaphysics. So he began doing lectures on metaphysics and on the philosophy of nature. Fifteen years after that, after many attempts to get other jobs, better jobs, again in Königsberg or at the university, but never really outside of it, he was appointed the professor of logic and metaphysics. Um, that was in 1770. Now, being a professor in a German university gives you a certain level of stability and financial safety, but it comes with a significant amount, then as now, of labor. Kant taught by contract, by his legal obligations, at 7 a.m., four days a week, and then did private teaching, tutorials and uh, reviews, things like that, for students who paid him extra or um, just came for his office hours um, every day. But all of his duties would end by lunchtime, which was always a really substantial meal for Kant. And uh, actually, at that meal, he famously always kept an open invitation um, to any sailor who appeared in the harbor of Königsberg, assuming that they were of relatively decent character, to come and share his meal and tell him what they had seen of the world. Though he didn't himself apparently want to, or at least feel the need to travel far, he was perpetually extremely interested in the outside world. He used to give lectures on world geography, and things like that. Very interested in the world. Now, he, he basically keeps this schedule for the rest of his life. And the good people of Königsberg famously used to say that you could set your, you could set your watch by uh, Professor Kant's walk after his lunch. Um, the one day he failed to take his walk is when he received in the mail from the 18th century version of Amazon.com uh, his copy of Rousseau's novel Emile, um, which he basically apparently read in one day avidly. Rousseau will come up later as one of Kant's enormous influences. The other great influence for Kant, of course, is one he discovered, it seems, in 1771. 
when he first encountered the work of David Hume, whose work he ever after credited for awakening him, he said, from his dogmatic slumbers. Having appreciated the work of Hume, Kant effectively went into a kind of intellectual seclusion and re-education, reconsidering the foundations of human knowledge and the basic structure of the world for the next 10 years. And in those 10 years, he published nothing. The authorities at the university must have been quite upset at this. They had just appointed this guy professor. He is a clearly a very prominent guy. And yet now, once he gets the job, he suddenly stops publishing things. First of all, it's astonishing, we should note this, how many of the people that we've been looking at in these lectures have had these long-standing periods of intensively private research. We saw it with Milton, we saw it with Hobbes, we saw it with Montaigne, now we see it with Kant. If we had um, the ability to know biographically more about people deeper in the past, Plato or Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, we would probably find similar intense periods of really radical interiorization in their lives, where they're really burrowing deep down into themselves and into their scholarship in a way that seems to make no sense to people outside of them. Secondly, and I say this as an academic, this silent period is a pretty strong argument for the sort of tenure that Kant himself had. Had Kant not been assured of permanent employment, he probably would not have been able to take um, to enjoy the peace and quiet required to undertake the massive project that he did. Because in those, those 10 years, he wasn't just being, uh, you know, an aimless, pointless dilly-dallier. He was rethinking the basic structures of human existence and knowledge themselves. In 1781, he broke his silence with the massive 800 pages in the German first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason. It was so vast, and in fact, precisely because he had been so deep down inside himself, inside his own thinking on this, it was so um, hard to attach, let's put it that way, it was so difficult to attach Kant's project to the fashionable questions, concerns, formulations of his age in the scholarly world, that the work actually was largely ignored on first publication. It took about 10 years, another edition of the critique, and some heavy efforts at explanation, revision, and publicity on the part of Kant and some of his friends and early followers, people who grasped what he was trying to do, which was not easy to do, even in that, uh, especially in that first edition. It's hard to understand Kant now, but it was especially hard to understand Kant in that first edition. It took about 10 years for people to begin to understand the impact of what he was doing. And when that happened, the philosophical world changed. Kant had effectively accomplished uh, what people called of his work a Copernican revolution in philosophy. He shifted the focus of philosophical attention from objects to the subject, to the knowing and acting subject. Before Kant, it's not entirely unfair to say that philosophers were caught in the naive assumption that the human knower can be taken for granted and that the puzzle is about how the outside world can be known. How is it that the world itself can be known to us is a puzzle really about objects in the world for earlier thinkers than Kant in some, in some way. After Kant, it becomes clear that the puzzle of knowledge is not first and foremost a puzzle about how the world can be known, but about how we can know our world and in what precisely that knowledge consists. Now Kant, after the first critique, which you might guess, because we call it the first critique, kept publishing works of enormous impact. He published two other very important critiques, the critique of practical reason, which is kind of his ethics, and then the critique of judgment, which is a study of aesthetics and the theory of beauty and the understanding of the meaning of art, how people experience beauty in the world. And he always taught rigorously up till 1796, fully 56 years after he had entered the University of Königsberg as a young student. He died in 1804. Now Kant's work can be understood as an attempt overall 
to retain something of the theoretical and intellectual ambition of Leibniz, while reckoning seriously with the challenge of other thinkers, especially human Rousseau. His work is important for all aspects of later philosophy and political theory, modern life in general. His understanding of the human and of the human's predicament about thinking about how it experiences the world has shaped all aspects of our life. Now, I won't go into it here, his larger philosophy, which is a lecture series entirely on its own. But let me just say that throughout his mature work, Kant tried to show that human reason has real power, but also real limits, and that the best exercise of that reason is to use it to chart the limits of human reasoning and thereby to deduce as clearly as possible without direct knowledge what it cannot properly know. So Kant actually famously said he denied reason to make room for faith, and not just religious faith, but faith in certain realities outside of our minds, certain moral truths that we cannot empirically prove. It is other critiques, and especially in the critique of practical, or sorry, in the critique of pure reason, especially in the critique of pure reason, Kant suggested that metaphysical theodicies cannot accomplish what they set out to prove, theodicies of the sort that Leibniz offered. And here he had learned a lot from Hume. Like Hume, he thought that the evidence of the world was simply indeterminate between there being a good God and there being no such deity, and even whether there is a bad God. Furthermore, he thought that the indeterminacy extended so far as to make any explicitly theoretical claims in this realm of thinking finally not confident enough to be defended. That is, Kant argued that arguments for and against the goodness of an omnipotent God in the face of the reality of evil are in fact interminable. They're unending. And that this fact that we can show that these arguments for the goodness of God and against the goodness of God both can continue without being radically refuted, but also will continue ad infinitum without being finally completely evidenced, completely proven, shows us, he thought, that sheer reason cannot answer our questions in this area. In fact, he thought, something more is required of us than sheer speculative cognition if we are to find a satisfactory response to the problem of evil. And what that is, is what Kant calls practical reason. Now, practical reason is the topic of his second critique, the critique of practical reason. We don't need to go into that very much here. But we can say that on this stuff, if he's understanding himself as appreciating the lessons of Hume on theodicy, here he's appreciating the lessons of Rousseau in response to Voltaire, especially about hope. If theory can't help us intellectually solve our problem with the problem of evil, what we need to do then is investigate why it is a problem for us at all. That is, we need to problematize, to identify as a puzzle, and to begin to be curious about the fact that evil bugs us. Deer are not troubled by the fact that lions hunt, stalk, and eat them. Antelope do not generate seminars about the problem of the wolf. Humans are the only creatures who seem to have this puzzle about why bad things happen to us. When we do this, when we investigate this experience we have, we discover that in fact we have another source of a kind of quasi-knowledge inside us, apart from reason, in the persistent urging of our will itself towards resisting evil, expressing outrage at it, and working to repair evil where we can. In short, we discover that it is our will that tells us what is evil and makes us experience it as evil. This experience of the will's opposition to evil is the basis of what Kant calls practical reason, properly understood. Now, practical reason properly understood, let me stop here for a second and think about this. What he wants to say is that if you understand why you are so outraged at this, this intuition about outrage at evil and wrongness, this intuition actually can serve as a kind of foundation for understanding how you should act in the world. If the world doesn't rationally give evidence for good or evil, nonetheless, the fact that we seek evidence for good 
is itself for Kant, the source of the, of the motive for us for doing good. Right? It's a brilliant move on his part. In other words, the morality of the world turns out to be not a fact about the world out there in itself, but again, it's a fact about how we can only live with ourselves, Kant thought, in some basic way, although people can clearly go wrong. How we can only live with ourselves, or best live with ourselves, if we live in a world where the intuitions that drive the basis of our action, those intuitions that we should live in a just world, are allowed to have their fullest extent in shaping our action and shaping the way that we, through our action, shape the world. Now, Kant's philosophical metaphysics, his epistemology, these have been enormously influential. His moral theory has been profoundly influential as well. But surprisingly, his thinking about evil itself has not often been studied or appreciated as much. Most philosophers actually will read the Critique of Pure Reason, the Critique of Practical Reason. The really uh, esoteric and beturtlenecked philosophers might go ahead and read the aesthetics of the Critique of Judgment. But much of the time, scholarly attention stops there. But the fourth of these books, the four big books he wrote, Religion Within the Limits of Bare Reason, hardly anyone looks at this book. Yet for our purposes, this is in fact the most important book, which he publishes in 1793 and is in some ways the last of the great uh, works of Kant. Now the book's title itself is very important for its argument. The book is an attempt to talk about rational religion, which is all we can know about religion from the perspective of human reason. And he suggests that actual historical religions function as clothes for this rational religion, with each historical religion more or less adequately clothing the rational religion. Right? So we can look at an historical religion, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, what have you, look at it and assess how properly it captures, it clothes that rational religion, the core of religious belief that Kant thought was universal, and that's how we can assess the adequacy of these historical pictures. The book then needs to talk about and wants to talk about religion naked of the historical trappings that any particular religious faith has put upon it. It wants to lay out the criteria for assessing any, any actual religious faith by looking at the core rational principles on which any religion Kant thinks has to be founded. Now I have my doubts, I study religion and I have my doubts about whether such a thing as rational religion exists, at least in the way that Kant thought it exists. It seems to assume, Kant seems to assume a unified core of basic religious beliefs common to all traditions, um, and yet that core doesn't seem there when you consider those many things that humans count as religions around the world, that we would count as religions around the world, whoever we are. But let's leave that alone for right now, and let's go on to think about what Kant is talking about here in terms of radical evil. For that's what's important in this book for us. Kant insisted that Christian dogmas of original sin get at a universal truth, meaningful even for those outside the Christian faith, that something he called radical evil can be seen to operate at the base of the human will. Now, talk about radical evil can seem maybe a bit mythological. Um, it can seem too melodramatic a picture. We'll see that many of Kant's own readers in his own time thought of that, thought of that worry and raised it with Kant, and many reviews complained about it. But Kant is not trying to be mythological, he's trying to be as precise as possible about the source of evil. He locates it, radical evil, in a fundamental disposition of the will to privilege itself over the general good. That is, radical evil is a defect in the human at the root of human agency. That's what radical means in Latin. Radius, it means at the root. It is a corruption, that is, radical evil, of our core moral maxim. That's what Kant calls the core moral disposition out of which we act. And it corrupts it so that we do not act out of the maxim that we should treat everyone as we would want to be treated, but instead we act out of some form of what Kant calls a maxim of sensible self-interest, where we treat everyone else in some way or other as instruments in a drama that is all about our own self-glorification. 
We treat everyone else as if they were bit players in a movie where we were the sole star. Now, interestingly, by talking about radical evil as corruption here, and Kant is very clear about this, he aligns himself with a certain strand of thinking we've seen already, what we can call broadly the Augustinian strand on evil. We'll see Kant dissenting from Augustine in some ways in a minute, but on this, he's very Augustinian. Because the corruption, as corruption, can never be total. We cannot but in some sense admit, Kant thinks, that other people exist, and so we know that we are compelled on some level to admit that they matter beyond our own self-interest. Thus, when we are selfish, Kant thinks we are rationally contradicting ourselves. We are incoherent. We are not as fully rational as we should be. Now, that means that evil, again, going back to Augustine, is always partial and always builds on a kind of irrationality um, that is at the heart of human maleficence in the world for this tradition. Nonetheless, for Kant, as we saw for Augustine, but let's focus on Kant here, this corruption of our moral maxim is so radical, is so deep in us, that it requires itself a radical transformation of our overall character. For Kant, the change is a matter of a revolution inside the self, a waking up to the reality that there are other people in the world who have as much moral import as you do, and that this transformation of the root disposition, the maxim, by which we guide our actions, is actually profoundly altering of our whole being. Kant says this is what early Christians talk about, about conversion, about metanoia, a change of one's whole being. Now, how does this happen? Kant actually doesn't really say, apart from saying that it is in some important way our decision, but because it's a decision at so fundamental a level of our being as to be in some sense a decision about how we are to decide things, right? It's about how we, how we act in general. So how do we decide to change the principle of how we decide? It's mysterious. And it seems to come, for us anyway, in our experience of it, it seems to come also from, in some sense, outside of us, as a kind of magic, or perhaps grace. Such changes as these, these radical transformations, are the sort of thing, Kant thinks, that only religious language has ever really adequately described. Now, Kant's views on radical evil were scandalous for many of his readers. They saw Kant as one of the great figures of the Enlightenment, of the idea that a human mind, unfettered at last from the tight shackles of tradition, daring, as Kant himself once put it, to think for itself at last, that this mind could on its own confront and overcome the age-old difficulties that had long vexed humanity throughout its history. For him now, to be talking about radical evil seemed to bring back all the old superstition and intellectual canards that they had fought so hard to escape. Some thought Kant had sold out to the emerging Prussian police state, which looked smilingly, as police states often do, on traditional religious practices. Others thought he had just become massively reactionary in his old age. Rumors even began to spread that he might be senile, going a little dotty in his dotage. But Kant knew better, and what he knew was that the language of radical evil meant to precisely capture the truth latent in traditional understandings, traditional religious understandings, namely, that evil's elimination from our lives is not easy or straightforward and is not entirely describable in terms of rational human action that is entirely self-willed. He meant to say that that idea is important without collapsing into or falling back to traditional notions of original sin, because Kant thought that those notions failed adequately to capture the individual person's responsibility for their wickedness. His language of radical evil means to be a sober acknowledgement of the profundity of human corruption, while also insisting that this is a condition that the human has brought upon him or herself. It's not an illness, it's a self-inflicted wound. Those who read him carefully realized he had aligned himself in his discussion of the nature of human moral action more with those heretical Christians who insisted that humans and not Christ, not grace, were fundamentally responsible for their own moral perfection. 
So once Kant was understood to be not so much defending traditional Christianity by his more extreme Enlightenment followers, but actually still endorsing a kind of Christian heresy, he became more tolerable to them. But nonetheless, the crucial thing he had done, which shadows of which had been done before, but he was the first person really to do it, which only became clear over time in the method he used, was to inaugurate or pioneer a method we can call demythologizing. Now, demythologizing, demythological, demythologizing accounts um, often suggest, in fact, essentially suggest, I would say, that a resolution to a problem we face must go beyond mere cognition, mere thinking about the problem and the explicit formulations of rational intelligence and appreciate the power and wisdom of myth. Now, nonetheless, these approaches, a demythologizing approach, insists there's positive wisdom and insight in myth. But this myth is something that only partially gets at the truth of the point, the demythologizer will say. So philosophical analysis, or some kind of clear analysis, conceptual clarity, must be applied in order to clarify and systematize the truth of the matter. Now, to do this, you have to recognize the obscure profundity, the demythologizer says, of traditional religion. How it suggests that sheer human experience, processed over many generations, has a level of insight that the simple activity of one person thinking on their own cannot provide. Again here, we see the tension, the conflict that comes out in a lot of these, a lot of these people we've been thinking about. The tension between the wisdom of experience versus the capacities of individual intellectual effort, of theory. The demythologizing, even though it's a very intellectually ambitious practice, is also profoundly suspicious of the idea that an individual act, simply acting on their own to think through these problems is going to come to the right or profound or suitable answers. Myth has a profundity of meaning, demythologizers will say, and a density of symbolic reference beyond the ability of any philosophical system to articulate in a full way. And the account says all this, even as it does not affirm such religious stories or mythologies as literally true, it seeks instead within them to find a deep though incompletely formulated truth about the human. It demythologizes in this way in taking out a myth and looking at it and identifying it and reformulating it in something that it thinks of as a clearer and more precise language of rational human cognition. Now this is a very controversial strategy in thinking about human life in general, and especially maybe in thinking about evil. There are a couple worries about it you can have. First of all, can it be completed? Is there some way that you can actually completely demythologize a myth and render it intelligible for and acceptable for intellectual digestion without any remainder? Lots of people have tried, and as far as I know, so far, no one has actually succeeded in that. Another way of framing this question is to ask rather directly, does such an attempt distort the mysterious mythological message at the heart of a story and render it so rational and articulate as to be flat-footed? It's possible, I imagine, to talk about Moby Dick, right, as a story about a fish. It's possible to talk about Hamlet as a story about um, an insecure prince. It's possible to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh as a story about a guy who feels really sad that he lost his friend. But in each of these formulations, something really important gets lost. Now, those are worries about this approach. But it's only fair to say that in important ways, we all in different ways undertake this approach all the time. Whenever you hear anyone talking about the profundity of ancient ways of thinking about evil and how they almost got things right, but now we know better, you're hearing the echo of Kant. You might have heard some of that in what I've said in previous lectures in this class as well. Also, whenever you hear anyone talking about the problem of humans being basically that they are selfish and implying that they have to make themselves better on their own, they are also echoing unknowingly, Kant. Kant turns out, that is, to be behind both the 
intellectual style of thinking about evil that has grown increasingly popular in the past several centuries. That is, not simply to dismiss the past as irrelevant, but to appreciate it, but at the same time, handle it with gloves made entirely of reason so that you try to discern in the muddy past a kind of rational, essential message that we can extract. That's one way he's been influential. The other is by focusing our attention essentially on the idea that at the heart of the human is a selfish will whose struggle to become better is a struggle that ultimately only the self can accomplish on his or her own. Now, from Kant now, I want to look at someone who disagreed with him, but also drew on him profoundly for a very different picture of evil, and a picture of evil that we've seen echoed in a distant past in our lectures before, in the thought of the theologian Irenaeus. That is, here I want to turn to the thought of the German philosopher Hegel.